Good morning, ladies and gentle furs. <laughs> uh, welcome to the South Africa Fur Podcast. Um, <clears throat> you're sitting here with myself, Ivic, uh, Scratch from Cape Town, mm -hmm. and all the way across the Pacific Ocean and across the entire land of Australia and Brisbane, uh, Jay, or Jay Coates, is it? Yes, that's correct. Uh, the Stoat from Brisbane, yes. Uh, also yes. a very prolific writer in, what is it? It was, I've forgotten. Fantasy and sci-fi. Yeah, that's one, yeah. Fantasy and science fiction. And um, also the owner of the, what's it, probably the only Australian publishing company that actually sells free uh, novels? Yes. Yeah, um, right. yeah Jaffa Books. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, the only one that I know of, I don't think there's any others. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, if, yeah, I mean, if there was any competition, they'd probably tell you. <laughs> You'd imagine so. Any relation yeah. to Jaffa Cakes? Sadly I not. I wish it was, but, yeah. <laughs> now I want a Jaffa. <laughs> I've never had a Jaffa. It's just like, sort of, it's just like a minced toasty, right? Something like that, I guess. Yeah. I haven't had one now. I just want one. I don't know why. <laughs> I know. I know. I was at a good food and wine show a while back, and they made a. They sold like a really cool, uh, Jaffel iron. Uh huh. Yeah. And I might try and find one and send one to you as a late birthday gift. Oh, speaking wow. of um okay, gifts okay. and shit, Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> happy Mother's Day. It's today. Don't well, forget. At least here in South Africa. Y yeah. Yeah, it was here as well. So. I don't know where okay. it doesn't. I, 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 I always keep forgetting it, that it's like for, what's forward and backwards. Like, is Australia still uh, like on the same day plus a few hours or on the same day minus a few uh, on the previous day or whatever? Fucking time zones. Yeah, yeah right now they're, yeah. they're on the same day. Same day in ahead. Yeah. Ah, okay, cool. Until I think, what's it? Five hours, three o'clock? Three o'clock our time, so about. Yeah, seven in the evening here, so... Okay. Okay. So, um, anyway, back back to topic. Uh, as, as pretty much a writer and things like that in um, Australia and everything like that, I'm really tired, I don't know why. Um, <clears throat> but, like, as a writer and being in Australia and everything like that, um, <clears throat> what were your sort of what were your influences when you became a furry? Like, influences ten years ago? Um, yeah, it would have been about then. I mean, because growing up for me, always fantasy fiction, and I'd say two things probably led me to furry through that was dragons and werewolves. Mm -hmm. And I'd say becoming a furry was kind of like a just an extension from loving all the sorts of books with dragons and werewolves as a child, so that makes sense. that's anywhere I'd say where it came from. Mm -hmm. But I mean, like with with dragons and werewolves, yet your furry is a stoat. Did you did you start off being either a werewolf or a a dragon? Did start off as a dragon, yeah. Um, yeah. But at the time in Brisbane alone, there was. Because I started off as a uh, blue dragon, blue scale mm -hmm. dragon, and there were four other blue scale dragons in Brisbane alone. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like, well, I kind of wanted a little bit of um, uniqueness rather than yeah. just being the same as everyone else. So it's a case of. I actually can't remember how it came to be stoked, but I think I think it was actually suggested to me as someone just huh. like um, just kind of just mentioned in a story I was writing. I oh, just um. Um, as a character, just what about a stoat? It's like, yeah, that kind of works. And just getting to know that character is like, actually, that kind of suits me a lot mm. more than Dragon did at the time. So, yeah, kind of just adopted, adopted it then. So, hmm. um, a, a interesting sort of like segue there. Uh, the word stoat, at least the way that we pronounce it, is uh, in Afrikaans. It's um, scratch. Help me out here. Stoat. No, yeah, naughty. Stoat. Disobedient. Naughty. Yes. No, I have been just... told that before, yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
So when it came, I mean, like obviously you wrote. Jeez, oh, now I've got to look at the Tumblr post mm -mm. Uh, because I am not on balls right now. Oh, it's, it's, it's not Twitter. early. It's eleven in the morning. It's, 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 <laughs> shut up. I you to, know I it's early. I worked early. for Fermeet yesterday. Shush. I work. We. I. I. I passed out on a couch and I woke up at two. In the morning. I'm just putting that out. <laughs> two in the morning. Yeah, and then we drove all the way back. And we, I got to sleep at about four, and I like woke up at quarter to nine, like freaking out very, very like quietly, uh, only to be told, no, it's only quarter to nine. I'm just like, okay. So Back I closed my eyes, and it felt like four hours had gone past, and it didn't. It was like half an hour. Uh, yeah, Axe and Stone, uh, Destiny of Dragons. Is that your most yes. recent novel? No, that was the first novel. Okay. Uh, yeah, first of currently released, I've released three with a fourth okay. to come, it should be this year. Um, okay. I think I'll get actually hit a few times if it's not this year. <laughs> um, yeah, um, no, one of my friends who's read all the books so far, she was a little bit annoyed by the cliffhanger endings I had, and yeah, had a bit of a slap on my shoulder for those. <laughs> hmm. um, now and uh, when was your last book written? It was 2040? 2015? Um, yes, the last book was released about this time last oh. year, actually. Okay. Yes, it was, yes. Yeah, this time last year was the last book released. Hmm. Okay. Um, interesting thing, there's, there's a guy called Omega. I'm not sure if you know him. He was yes. apparently on about two hours ago. And uh, was waiting <laughs> off of the uh, yeah, chat. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's kind of disappeared right now. <laughs> yeah, I told him a while back that this would be happening right now, and I think he just um, kind of got a little bit ahead of himself there. Oh. Okay. <laughs> and um, as as a publisher, and obviously you, you'd probably be your own publisher then, uh, do you have uh, an editor or somebody on your side who actually also checks through your work and and uh, make sure that you're doing fine, or, or do you just do that yourself? For other people's books, I mostly do it myself. Uh -huh. uh, but, yeah, it's never a good thing to rely on yourself for your own writing, because yeah. it's always said that you will read what you intended to write, not necessarily what you have written. Uh -huh. um, so, because you, you know in your head what, what you're trying to convey, what the meanings are, what the... Um, behind the scenes information is and all that sort of stuff mm -hmm. uh, so you may not realize that you're not giving enough information about a character and just um, not explain enough mm -hmm. uh, and also of course you'll always miss your own typos yeah so yeah, yeah it's always better to have other eyes look over it who who know what they're doing as well not just mm -hmm. your mom who will just look at you and whatever you Whatever it is, your mum will say, oh, it's amazing. <laughs> um, so, yeah, you always need someone who will give honest critique and yeah. a skilled critique as well. Uh. Mm -hmm. Okay, because um, I know that, what's it, uh, Carl Gold obviously has his own uh, publishers and things like that, and they obviously yes. hold him to a deadline. Is it is it difficult being your own publisher and holding yourself to a deadline, kind of being your own boss? Yes, <laughs> simple answer <laughs> is um, you need to yeah you need to set your own deadlines and you've got to make sure you stick to them because mm -hmm. otherwise you'll get distracted by other things and even if it's other worthwhile things to be doing like I often get distracted by publishing other people's books okay. and just end up getting about my own so you've you've got to set time aside to work on your own stuff and get just mm. get it finished. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I mean, obviously, as, as a writer, uh, you take, uh, what's the word? Uh, um, you, you find information or things like that that you're able to sort of incorporate in your books and things like that. Uh, what, what would you say would be your, uh, what, what was the book that inspired you to be able to start writing? Um, oh, I'd say most writers will have a book that inspired them positively. Mm -hmm. um, and say, oh, I read this book and I was inspired. I, I, I'd love to be able to write as well as this or whatever. 
For me, it was kind of the other way around. I read a book and it's like, no, I, I can do better than this. Okay. Uh, for me, but um, it, it's it's hard to say it without sounding kind of big headed and up myself a bit because it's a mm-hmm. popular book. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't know if you've read Elegon by Christopher mm. Paolini. For but me, he wrote that when he was eighteen, wasn't it? When he started. He started writing when he was seventeen, mm-hmm. and I think he was twenty one when his parents published the book. Okay. Um, but for me, because I discovered it and a book about dragons, fantasy book, is perfect for me. And I read it the first time and I loved it. Mm-hmm. Then I read it a second time and I started noticing all the little mistakes and all the little cliches and where it had been quite blatantly copied from other writers. Yeah. And like notice that the main character was actually kind of just a bit of a cardboard cutout. He wasn't mm-hmm. very interesting. And it was after reading it for the second time, I was like, I, I, I could probably do better from this. Yeah. Um, I'll leave it up to my readers to decide if I have. I mean, <laughs> I'm not going to say that I've done better, but he's won a few more awards than I have. Sold a few more copies, but... <laughs> yeah, I'd just, like to think you know, a couple. Had, had a few more <laughs> yeah, movies just, just made about his work. Speaking of yeah. movies... Those movies were shite. <laughs> oh. it, was only, it was only one, wasn't it? <laughs> I mean, yeah, it was just it was one. A, it, was a, it was a pretty terrible movie. I mean, yeah. Poor That's Jeremy Irons was there trying to make it look good, but yeah, he only do so much. <laughs> Look, the movie was so bad, it probably could have warranted a cameo by... Um... Who's that guy who makes all those movies like every single year? Uh, Nicolas Cage. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> randomly screaming at someone at some point. <laughs> Not the dragons! Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, but you tell having dragons in your eyes. <laughs> oh, yeah, in this case. It's, yeah, I, I feel sorry for him on, on one on one side and on the other side I kind of sit there going like... <sighs> It's just Nicolas Cage. Well, his, <laughs> his, his entire career is in like a quantum state of good and not good. Because there are some roles that you like where he's definitely warranted, like his skill is well placed, and others are just like, yeah. what were you what? thinking? What did you say? Could he say it's Schrodinger's Cage? Possibly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Schrodinger's Cage because it's both a terrible and amazing state at the same time. Definitely. Yeah. In most movies, he just, he's just... I mean, like, it's its weird. I like Captain Corelli's mandolin. Most people panned it. Um, I... Well, I... Is that, like, your... Is that his best role for you, or not? Uh, not necessarily. It was a terrible Italian accident. <laughs> but, I mean... Then again, you're, you're looking at... Uh, what's his name? They, they lauded him for his Afrikaans accent in Blood Diamond. Ah, uh, Leo DiCaprio. Yeah, it was a terrible Afrikaans yeah. accent. It, it was one of those things that you kind of sat there going like, oh my goodness. He just went to Brackpan for two days, listened to the accent around there, and just went, hi, I'm going to run with this. Mm. Most but Afrikaans what, people are just like, what? Wasn't he meant to be Zimbabwean? Was that it? Was it? Or possibly, was it? <laughs> possibly Namibian. I don't know. Yeah. Well, mm. Or maybe just generic. Yeah. African, yeah. yeah. Without really specifying anything. Do you remember Matt Damon also yeah. like did an Afrikaans accent for a movie about rugby? Oh yes, of oh, course, oh, wasn't he? Yeah. Invictus. He Who was, was he Francho. Again? He was Francho Pinot in Invictus. Francho Pinot. There's yes, no that way that that guy looks like Francho Pinot at all. I know. Was that one where Morgan Freeman played Mandela? Uh, Mandela. Yes, yeah. I was. Mm. He tried Invictus, his best to yeah. say Guillermo, but it didn't work. Guillermo, basically. <laughs> like close enough, isn't it? <laughs> Not even. Yeah. Well. <laughs> yeah. If you need an Afrikaans accent, just like just put Shalto Copley in a room with some Boltong, and like you'll just get a shit ton of material out of that. You fuck a brom. You fuck a brom. <laughs> Here comes the sweetie, man. Fuck, I love that oh movie. Boy. It was pretty good. Um. So uh, with with your publishing and everything like that, I mean, um. Being a person who's been going to Furdu for what the past ten years as well, 
or at least since uh, free is around. Yeah, well, so I think six, um, seven six years. years. Yeah. So in other words, there were it's 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 been around for eight years. Something like that, I think. Yeah. Mm. So, <clears throat> I, I, I'm not even sure. Like, I mean, like Duke would be a popular from Australia, but he's not really Australian anymore. He's moved to America now. Yes. But um. Like, how is the uh, how would the the Australian a fandom sort of compare to something like, you know, uh, the the American fandom or the Canadian fandom, or for that matter, the Brazilian fandom, which has been moving around for a couple of for for a while now. I know that I think y you guys are a little bit smaller than I think yeah um, yeah definitely a lot smaller, um, mm -hmm. mainly because it's a lot more spread out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, kind of the same problem. Australia is, yeah, because yeah. Australia is a similar size in terms of land mass as the United States, mm -hmm. and yet it's got about a tenth of the population as a as a whole. So because yeah. there's a lot less people, there's going to be a lot less furries, and yeah, they're going to be living a lot further apart. Mm -hmm. So yeah. people from Perth, for example, won't fly over to Brisbane. Yeah. Or to the Gold Coast for Ferdu because, well, that's a four hour flight at least. Yeah. Um, so, really, the conventions, I think, yeah, we've got three conventions one in Gold Coast, one in Melbourne, and one in Perth. Mm. It's largely local people attending, with mm -hmm. some interstates, some interstate people, and then a much smaller percentage from overseas. Yeah. And Would, I think our maximum attendance has been about 600 people for convention. Hmm. So, it's still a lot. Much smaller. That is quite a lot. Oh, it, yeah, it's a lot, but you compare it to like the large US ones, and they're drawing hmm. double travel, travel that even and more. So, well, I mean, what was it? Uh, furry uh, Anthrocon got uh, 6,000, 7,000 people? Something around that, yeah. Not about right. Yeah. I mean, um, like what what we were what we're doing in South Africa is we're trying to get people to a central area in South Africa, and I'm one, I'm, I'm looking yeah. at a map right now, and I'm kind of thinking, well, the most central area that I'm seeing right now is Alice Springs, in the Northern Territory, but that's like what mid desert. Yeah, there is uh, nothing there. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> I mean, no one, hardly anyone, voluntarily goes to Alice Springs. Th Look, that, you guys have uh, a Townsville. That's that's cute. Dude, that, <laughs> did it, yeah. Do you remember that all the big cities in Australia are around the coast, and that's for a reason? Yeah. Yes. Because it's not death. Yeah. It's, it's completely death. uninhabitable everywhere you, you, else. Yeah. Quite largely, yeah. I mean, yeah, they, they all cling to the coast because it's not as hot. Hmm. Uh, and yeah, there's actual rainfall, which you get like <laughs> once a year, maybe, in Alice Springs. And you probably still get the same average rainfall over across the whole year, but it's all at once. Mm. So, yeah, you can have flooding and drought simultaneously in the same place. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and it's usually on fire as well. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> that, oh. So, God bless that, Australia. Um, they need it. Yeah. Yeah. When it, obviously, if we look at South Africa, a lot of the animals that we tend to choose, we we don't choose the springbok. We don't choose the blackback jackal. Uh, we have a cow for starters, as as one of our one of the furries in our in, in our fandom. Yeah. Um, and uh, is is it a similar thing that side? I mean, like nobody's a wallaby that side, or. Um. Uh, I would or say Tasmanian. I yeah, I have known more people with kangaroo centers to not be Australian. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's yeah, I'd say there's, yeah, I'd say there's a lot more Australian personas in the US than there is mm. in Australia. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you, you, I'd say the only common or reasonably common Australian animal as a fazona in Australia that I know of is dingo. Yeah. It's quite a few dingoes. Um, that makes sense. You wanted to find a canine. You'd, you'd yeah. think that we do like blackback jackals more often here. 
And I've only ever met one black black jackal, and he's also from America, but he's also yeah. from Britain. But he's also got Canadian citizenship, <laughs> so I'm not. <laughs> he's an interesting man. Okay. Um. <clears throat> so. Uh, obviously, we were we were talking about like you know. Oh, how did how did you guys actually find Zoo Zootopia? Like, was that accurate for you guys in respect to like a lot of things, or, or was there as much hype there as there is here? Because like South Africa is still going completely and utterly nuts for it. I would say so. I mean, um, I don't know what other cities did, but uh, in Brisbane we had because we have a um, weekly meetup, um, yeah. South Brisbane Furry Meet, which is one of the largest weekly meets in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, well, at least it used to be. I think it's kind of died down a little bit now. But um, yeah, yeah, we uh, had on a Tuesday night. We all went to the cinemas and all watched it together. There was yeah. probably about nearly two dozen first suiters, which was a pretty impressive turnout. Mm. And yeah, I mean, general opinion was that I think there's been some people in Brisbane who've gone to see it like ten times now. So there's definitely a lot of people who absolutely adored this film. And okay. whereas I thought it was an incredibly well made film. Incredibly well written mm-hmm. film as well. Mm-hmm. Um and I think the first ten to fifteen minutes was one of the best examples of visual world building I have seen in a film. Yeah. Uh, especially when she was going into the city for the first time, just them showing everything was mm. almost textbook perfect. Mm. Uh, so I'd say that it's it's not just a good film because it's furry, it's a good film because it's actually very well made. Yeah. Was it also called Zootropolis, your side, or...? No, it was Zootopia here as well. Uh, okay. So it's a two. Yeah, I know, I know the UK had it at Zootropolis as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I know. Yeah, there are some licensing issues, I think, in some countries. I think so it had like change the name. It had like three or four different names. Like there was, there Zootopia, was either Zootopia, Zootropolis. Uh, uh, there was Zoomania as well somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty. Yeah, pretty sure there was a couple of others. Huh. I found it really strange, but yeah, you'd think Disney of all people could be able to settle like licensing disputes. You'd think so, but... Apparently not. Let's see. Zootopia names. Okay, that's not what I wanted. Close enough, though. Um, I mean, the characterization of the, of the characters is also very good. Um, let me see. Yeah. Also known as Zootropolis in some European uh, countries and the UAE, but that's it. Okay. Good enough. Apparently we're uh, part of the UAE now. <laughs> no, we just we get all the UK offshoot. <laughs> there, was, there was some, yeah, we got like a I think it was for Shrek as well. Uh, for Shrek we got um, the UK shoot where like a lot of stuff was taken out, like mentions about the Crusade, like things like that. <laughs> Mentions about crusade. Yeah, it's like, uh, like yeah, and like <laughs> one character says he did up an old war wound, but um, uh, in the American version, they actually say it's an old crusade wound. So like mention like those kinds oh, of mentions well, in... suppressed. Was that in? Um, I think that was the king in Shrek too, wasn't it? it I believe so. Had an old war. I believe so. Interesting. Okay, didn't know about that. <laughs> so yeah. Um, Lots of censoring. Hmm. Well, subtle censoring. Yeah. Obviously, um, well, what's the word? Uh, Southern Hemisphere uh, freedom is, like we always also mentioned, like very, very small and things like that. Uh, is What's the furry population like in New Zealand? Um, I know a few from over there. Um, I know they do have their own convention as well. Uh, uh, what's it called? I, I would... I would very, very, like, easily call that furry down under, down under. Uh, <laughs> I think it's, I think it's Furcon NZ. Something. Okay. Simple enough. Or Furcons, as it is. Um, but yeah, I know that's a much smaller convention again. I think they only get about 150 people or so. 
each time. Mm -hmm. So I can't imagine they've got a big population there. Yeah. Um, um, one of the other questions that I have is obviously in South Africa, where uh, predominantly, uh, I guess, white male uh, grouping. Um, is there any more diversity around your side? Um, oh, I'd, say, I'd say the majority of the population is actually um, is gay males here. <laughs> uh, I think certainly it used to be. I mean, because I'm not as active amongst the weekly meets now, but yeah, there's a time where like three quarters of a weekly turnout was gay male. Hmm. Um, no, I think I definitely say there's a, a lot more females now yeah uh, but again i still think straight males and females are still a minority mm. which uh sure you could spend hours talking about why that would be and going into all sorts of um psychological reasons behind it but yeah i mean definitely um definitely um gay and lesbian dominated hmm. and uh color wise um I'd say yeah, it's certainly majority, majority white. I mean, uh -huh. certainly I don't know of any ind indigenous Australians yeah. who are furbies, mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, there aren't too many um, non-whites. So okay, yeah, it's hmm. interesting. Scratch. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, you ha you have your own publisher, right? You're publishing like House or whatever you want to call it, How's it called? Yes. Yeah. Um, Jaffa. How do you go? Yeah. Jaffa, yeah. yeah. How do you go about uh, the actual like printing of the books? Could you would you consider like what you do, self-publishing? Because yeah, I um, have. For uh, my I books, have... yeah, I'm self-publishing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, self-publishing my books through my publishing label, but yes, definitely still self-publishing. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um. And I use a combination of print-on-demand and also traditional printers for other peoples. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I use two different printers depending on uh, the service I need at the time. Okay. Okay. Cool. Because um, I'm always wondering like how the self-publishing process works. Is it literally just a case of uh, uh, yeah? Let me say this: How do you sort of get the word out? How do you build a repertoire as a as an as a writer? And as an author, that is the million-dollar question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, it, nowadays, especially leaning a lot towards social media, mm -hmm. you have to have a social media presence. Mm -hmm. um, Which I'm assuming you manage yourself. Bookstores. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm pestering your local bookstores is always a good way to go mm -hmm. um, until they get sick of the side of you. Just. <laughs> Do a lot of uh, book signings, all that sort of stuff when you can. Mm -hmm. um, local newspapers, uh, especially like yeah, local newspapers are normally pretty, pretty keen to showcase local talent. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's all that's always a good pl uh, place to go to. And then, I mean, you could do everything correctly, and you'll never get anywhere. Sometimes, mm. which is a shame, but. Uh, sometimes, yeah, you just need to wait for that stroke of luck, basically, where yeah. just keep on going, keep on uh, keeping at it, and mm -hmm. then one day it'll just click, and mm -hmm. you'll become the next overnight success after about eight years of work. <laughs> that that critical mass point, I, I'm assuming, takes quite some time to get to. It can do, yeah. For some people, it happens in a year. Mm -hmm. For other people, it can take five years. Uh, but as so long as your work is good enough, it'll get there. Yeah. Ooh, fair point. No. Um, and I mean, uh, would would you be able to uh, be the publisher for, say, people here in South Africa? I see that you uh, have a, a poetry anthology there as well, but that's that's one person's poetry. Yes. Uh, um, so I know that what's it, Penguin and all those people. I've sort of had a look at their publishing um, houses and whatnot, and going like, I would dearly love to be able to, you know, post poetry and get that stuff going. But yeah. I mean, obviously, uh, going through Penguin, I read through their little, what do you call it, their uh, application process, and they're like, no, no poetry. 
We don't we don't do it. Poetry, yeah. Uh, poetry is tricky because it's certainly nowhere near as big a seller as prose. Yeah. Um, so there aren't very many markets for them. And mm. yeah, when I did, because I don't take poetry submissions anymore, unfortunately, because okay. it just simply was not selling at all. Mm. So, I mean, there are certainly markets for it. Uh, I just wasn't able to access them myself, unfortunately. So I've so, um, stopped doing it. But yeah, you just got to keep trying to find them, basically. Yeah. Oh, it's it's that's that's always an interesting perspective, hmm? No, no. Oh. Yeah. No, sorry, I was I, I wasn't saying it. I wasn't saying anything. I was just like agreeing. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's that's actually always kind of interesting. Is is that I mean, obviously, back in the back of the day, back in the fifteen hundreds. Um, <laughs> 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, maybe. Poetry was, was a lot more, I guess, accessible. People wanted to read it. People wanted to see it. I mean, um, is everybody knows everything about, like, you know, uh, sonnets and things like that. And I, uh, it, it probably died down around about the 1970s, 1980s, where, where poetry like that just decided to sort of peter out for a while. Mm. I mean, you look at you look at the people that we 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 look out for po for poetry these days, and you're looking at what's it, you know, Brayton Breitenbach from like the 1980s, and um, you know, it's 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 very very annoying that like there's nothing new poetry coming out. nowadays. Yeah, I mean, we we yeah, had to do a comparison in in third year uh, to check the entirety of white privilege and goodness knows what else. It was. Uh, one of, and th this is the poetry comparison that we had. It was two songs, we were doing intertextuality, and it was Macklemore. <laughs> it's something. Third years. At least it's not like freaking. It, yeah, at least it's relatable. Good, good luck. Of good mm -hmm. job on that. At least it's something you, that's okay. recent, as opposed to, I don't know, like Shakespeare or Frost or something from like way back when. Mm -hmm. But they were endemically good poetry, anyway. It was it was very good at what they did. It's just, mm. I mean, like if we look at writing as well, it's not like, I mean, let's let's not kid ourselves. I mean, people don't read as much as they used to, and if they do read, it's you know small news blurbs here and there. In fact, most people would look at a newspaper and look at the the titles and go, okay, cool, I know enough about everything now. Yeah, and, and people don't even look at newspapers anymore. I mean, it's all just mm. uh, clickbait headlines. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ugh. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um. Whew. Uh. So I mean, like, when when it comes to writing, being a publisher and things like that. I mean, obviously, you have to get people to to uh, buy the book or put it onto their shelves for you. And doing. Do you do any readings in the in the uh, li ugh, libraries, uh, bookstores where you do book signings or? I've or never done just... readings there, but I have done mm -hmm. a, yeah, I have done signings around the local area quite a few times. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, I've never actually done uh, reading. Okay. Have you thought about doing readings ever? Um, I've thought about them, but yeah, I've never been there. Uh, like the bookstores in there aren't really too well set up for any readings. They're all quite small. Basically, so there's not a huge amount of space, or we're in, a, in the middle of a busy shopping centre, and if I did a reading, no one would hear me. You've, so, true. Fair point. Yeah. And I mean, uh, were you, you've, you've been, what's it, guest of honour at uh, Ferdu now? Uh, how was that experience in comparison to, you know, just going there? What, what's the difference? Um, in. When it comes down to it, because there wasn't a massive amount of difference, there was a more recognition of who I was. Like um, I was there at the um, opening ceremony, so people got to know who I was that way. Mm -hmm. um, but throughout the weekend itself, I wouldn't say there was a massive amount of difference for me, mm -hmm. uh, especially because, again, like I said before, Ferdu, it's a fairly local convention, so a lot of people already did know who I was just mm -hmm. because they're part of a local community. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, certainly amongst um, the um, 
the interstate. So, so I'd say a lot more people knew who I was that way and okay. were introduced to my works. So yeah, it definitely, definitely did help that way, but. Bonus. Okay. Quite. Um, <clears throat> and yo, what else? Scratch. Hmm? I'm always uh, going to defer to like I have, yeah, <laughs> like I have a list of questions myself. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm mhm. Um. I'm sorry. That's that's an airplane. Oh, so so it sounded like some someone was echoing. Yeah. No, it was. It's it's literally the sound of an airplane. I could hear nothing just for like a couple seconds there. <laughs> um, yeah. How um, does? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think I have a question. Uh, how does your yep. uh, distribution network work? Like, where do you usually just like uh, plop everything down? Is it uh, are your books available for order? Do you send a bunch to, like you said, local uh, uh, local media outlets, uh, online sales? Yeah, I mean, um, all of books are available on Amazon through the Kindle store. Mm -hmm. um, and some are available through Kobo as well, so for your ebooks. Mm -hmm. uh, plus, of course, my own website as well deals with ebook yep. sales. Uh, and then for distribution, I mean, a uh, new printer I've, I work with now, uh, they are a print on demand service. And they've got locations, I think they've got about five locations for, uh, uh, through the world. So they're able to. Whoa, that's loud. That was a loud one. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> um, you see what you just said? <laughs> uh, Sorry. <laughs> How just happened there? <laughs> that was a jet <laughs> flying like really low. Are you like, are you <laughs> near? Right outside the window. <laughs> yeah, are you near an air force base or something? We're near two. Fuck. <laughs> there's Watkins and then there's uh, Vatikluv. Of course, and it's not late in the evening when they oh. when they're not doing stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Whew. <laughs> um, but yeah, as as I was saying, um, yeah, like I can, someone orders in the U.S., I can print a book in the U.S. and have it shipped straight to them, rather mm -hmm. than having to have it printed in Australia and then spending a small fortune to get it out of Australia, because mm -hmm. shipping out of Australia is a nightmare. Understandably so. Because <laughs> it's so far from everywhere. Yeah. Are you considering possibly like opening your uh, maybe to international borders and things like that? No, Brazil, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think Sofa Wolf is attempting to uh, sort of open up little areas within the Brazilian um, uh, furry fandom down there. And uh, I think maybe we, we lack, I think, to a large extent, a publishing company who'd be willing to, to do things down in South Africa. Yeah. I mean, because uh, what I do, cause, yeah, cause, uh, except if I um, distribute for Third Planet and for Rabbit Valley, um, I don't have any distribution deals for my stuff yet, but mm -hmm. once I, certainly once I get a larger range of things, um, I'm hoping to be able to set something up in the okay. US and in Europe, perhaps. Um, but yeah, I mean, and yeah, because in the South Africa, yeah, I don't think there's really much in the way of um, not, I don't know any furry riders out there. I'm sure there's a couple, uh, but contrast is a is a furry rider down here. He's oh, I think yeah. what's it? He's been writing for the past couple of years. He's just broken something like what 150, uh, 100,000 words on his one book. Under, oh. yeah. Mm -hmm. So we do have a couple of people down here who do actually write a little. Um, <clears throat> Doge would probably be a good writer, since he reads a lot. He does actually, mostly Carl Gold's stuff, and I think he's started reading your books now as well. Oh, excellent. Yeah, mm. yeah. yeah because I know there's not too many Australian writers. Yeah. Um, Australian furry writers, anyway. I mean, um, as far as I know, there are three published fairy writers with a fourth to come because he's just got a 
a short story accepted in an anthology. Um, but yeah, there's yeah, just three of us so far. So not a massive amount, <laughs> which is a shame, mm. but yeah. I know there's a lot more writers um, who aren't published. I'm just writing, putting stuff up on SF or FA and just mm. doing it for them, for themselves rather than actually going to aim to be published. So, yeah. Huh. So, um, your I guess uh, when it comes to your routine, because I know that uh, Cal Gold has a routine. Tempo has his own little routine. Yeah. Cal Gold pretty much wakes up, has a cup of tea, and then sort of sits down. And uh, I think at one point we were we were talking to him. And he said that his characters sometimes get a bit muddled. Uh, especially when he's working on two different types of books at the same time, yeah, uh, he'd be like <laughs> planning. He'd be planning for one and then be <coughs> writing for the other one, and kind of sit there going like, "No, wait, they can't do that. They don't know this <laughs> thing that." So yeah, I mean, how's, I do that a lot. <laughs> it's not the same world. How's your? Um, hmm? It's not the same world, even like it's not. Yeah. So, uh, what what would your um, routine be? Um, so I'd say I do most of my writing towards the evenings, mm -hmm. um, mainly because I um, work as well, so I have, have another job to deal with. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, usually it's when I get home from there, I'll sit down and do some writing. Yeah. Uh, and I'm a sort of writer, I tend to have too many projects at the same time. I've got like four or five different short stories I'm working on, or I've got... Mm -hmm two different, um, that was one point when I had two different novels at the same time, which is not the best thing to do, because, yeah, like so you just get distracted by, well, they distract each other in a way, so mm -hmm. you end up not doing anything. Yeah. Uh, I had uh, Reborn, which was one I released last year. I was writing simultaneously to Impossible Magic, which okay. was my second fantasy book. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, it was... It was tricky trying to get back into the right mindset for them because they were two very different books. Um, one told first person perspective, one told third person. So mm -hmm. I made so many mistakes in Reborn where I used um, where I used first person or vice versa with impossible magic. Yeah. So I had to go back and correct all of those in editing. <laughs> so yeah, it's always best to focus on the one. Mm. Okay. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, I, I don't think I've got a specific set routine. Mm -hmm. uh, like, I don't, because I know some writers, I know uh, Philip Pullman, who's one of yeah. the writers I admire. He's one who, he goes down, he sits down, he writes a certain amount of words per day, every day, no more, no less. Uh, so he's very regimented in how he writes. But um, I'm a lot more free with my writing. So yeah. I'll write however much I feel I can. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes I don't don't write anything in a day. Sometimes I can write. Um, I think the most I've ever written in a day is about eight thousand words. Sure, nice. Um, uh, especially when doing Inano Rima, which is great for for deadlines. Uh, which is if you don't know Inano Rima, it's National Novel Writing Month, which is every November. Oh right, yeah. And you face a challenge to do fifty thousand words. In a month. Sheesh. So, yeah. so 1,667 words on average per day for a whole month. Wow. And it's a great way to just blitz through most of a first draft. I so I always try to start a novel in November because, yeah, I'm able to get a really good head start and get some momentum going on it. Mm -hmm. hmm. And I guess that it, it obviously has to be coherent. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Just... I mean, yeah. I mean, there are some people who you do NaNoWriMo and they just put stream of consciousness onto the page. Uh -huh. And so they'll just start writing a sentence and they'll just follow it wherever it goes, even including their own internal monologue, even if it has nothing to do with the characters on the page. Mm -hmm. That's not the way to do NaNoWriMo. <laughs> I mean, yeah, okay, it's got to be it's got to be decent. Yeah. It's not going to be perfect. No. Yeah. No first draft is perfect, but yeah, yeah, you you've got to be able to build upon it rather than just delete thirty thousand words. Yeah. 
I suppose stream of consciousness stuff has its place, but not not in like writing a novel. Mm. Yeah, yeah, uh, basically. Stream of consciousness is what Twitter is for. Yes. But I mean, even then, 160 characters. Try Facebook. I think that might work. Or just have an angry blog. Have you seen? Yeah, angry blog is like that. <laughs> yeah, angry blog is good. <laughs> and have you seen um, people I mean, like Jaden Smith's yeah? Twitter account? Oh my god. Oh, please don't. If you've seen, if you've never properly seen like stream of consciousness taken in the wrong direction, just go there. Mm. Oh, whatever. Yeah, hmm. no, idea what goes through his head. Yeah, it's mental. Someone, oh, he is uh, a little bit mental. Yeah. There, w there was a challenge on, I think it was um, college humor, where uh, someone, <laughs> someone like may, uh, put out a tweet saying. Um, you have to tell a, like a post-apocalyptic st like story, post-apocalyptic um, uh, adventure using only um, uh, Jaden Smith's tweets as his like replies and internal <laughs> thoughts. <laughs> and it's actually working out pretty interestingly at this point. I'll see if I can find it. Should totally do that. Yeah. Uh, that that sounds like a challenge in and of itself. <laughs> Well, oddly enough, I'm pretty sure that him as a character would probably be as close to, um... Who's that guy with a hat in Walking Dead? Uh... Which one? Which one with what hat? The guy with the, like... The, the, the... The, Re the lead character, Rick Grimes. The lead character, yeah. What about him? What? What? No, I don't know. Like, it would probably be accurate to his internal thinking. Possibly. Maybe. Oh, we'll see. Huh. So, um, for the budding writers, uh, which I'm sure that we have a lot of at this point, I think I remember Kyle mentioning that there was uh, a very, very big influx of people who have who've begun to start writing and actually getting quite good at it. Um, <clears throat> what was that? That's the oh. thing. Yes. Ah, okay. Um... Would you say that how how do you think that as as a, as a writer yourself how would you inspire other people to begin to you know put their thoughts on paper put their characters that they've probably got milling about in their head um, and to actively uh, like try to get yeah I would say especially if you've got if you've got the characters clamoring to have their story told it's always mm -hmm. so much more satisfying to actually be able to to read it rather than just listening to them the whole time because. I know a lot of writers will understand that the characters, they're, they're real people in a way. Mm. Um, like, I interact with my characters as though the actual people I know. And <laughs> I'm just there telling their story uh, for everyone else to know about them. Mm. Okay. Uh, like, often it's, like, sometimes they're, the characters, are, they're, they're my little babies sometimes. Or sometimes they're my friends. And yeah, it, I know for people who don't write, it'll sound like I need to be in some sort of institute just for talking about these imaginary people as though they're real. But that's genuinely what, genuinely what it feels like. Um, and yeah, the satisfaction of seeing their story written out and completed, like, I don't think there's really anything quite like that. Mm. Um, in terms of just how amazing it feels. And then to have people actually sitting there and people talking about your characters. Yeah. As well, that, like, it's surreal at times. But people are talking about your creations and saying that they, they just like reading about it, like they like hearing about these characters. And it's mm -hmm. like, very few things compared to that, I'd say. Um, hmm. They're just the satisfaction of having something completed is uh, just makes it all worthwhile. Mm. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> like, like, do you do, um, yeah, sorry, go, Scrum. Like, yeah, I kind of want to say, like, making anything, like, co completing anything creative is, mm. well, a feat and a sort of a joy in and of itself, but if it can be something that gets people talking or thinking and you're seeing it out in the world, that's like almost like even more 
of a joy to see. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure every um, visual artist gets the same sort of thrill yeah. when someone comments on their their pictures. I mean, yeah. Um, it's just, yeah, it's uh, really uplifting to hear people talking about your work and saying they like it. I and mean, it, it's even in the same way. It's, it can even be nice to hear when someone doesn't like it, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. as long as it's just not mindless hate coming yeah. towards okay. you. No, but if someone can say, oh, I didn't really like this, but this is the reasons why I didn't like it, mm. then that yeah. can make you learn as a writer or as an artist or whatever it is that you do. Yeah. Because um, you're able to know, okay, this is how I can improve. Because mm. mm. no writer will, or no artist will ever think their work is perfect. Yep. Sure. If you think that, it's clearly not. Because <laughs> um, you will or you're always Smith. be learning. <laughs> or yeah, or you uh, ascended to a different reality, <laughs> like James <laughs> Smith. Yes. Um, but yeah, you will always be improving and always find new ways to make your work better. Um, and yeah, as long as you don't get disheartened by that, which it comes out that you shouldn't. Mm. Um, yeah, you always improve. Uh, speaking of constructive criticism, sorry that I'm uh, like. Cutting you off, no. Ivic. Uh, speaking of like Go for criticism it. and stuff, um, has there ever been a point where you or someone uh, like commenting on your work has gone like, why did the character do this? It seems like it seems out of character. Like it seems like something they wouldn't do. How do you? Uh, yes. How, how do you prevent that yeah, and I... pull back from that? Uh, like, uh, not mindset, but how how do you? keep your characters on track? Um, that can be quite tricky because sometimes characters just take hold of a story and run with it. Mm-hmm. Um, where it, it can take you in ways where you never really plan to go. I mean, um, but I suppose it's just a case of once you've finished drafting it, so you finish your first draft where you don't worry about any any of that sort of thing. Then you just need to go back and look at it and just just read it over several times and just put yourself in the mindset of character. Um, yeah, you just you basically as the writer, you've got to understand this character completely. Yeah. Because uh, if you if you haven't done that, then you put yourself at risk of the characters doing things that they shouldn't do. Mm. Um, and you've also got to then get a second pair of eyes to go over it as well yeah. and ask them, especially if, if you have a little bit of doubt about one character doing things they shouldn't be doing, get someone to say, okay, just read through this. Don't focus on about anything apart from this character. Um, does this character do everything as they should in the way that I've explained them? Because uh, it may be that they're acting out of character because you've just missed some important information to explain them. Like, uh, forgotten to mention a specific aspect of their backstory which justifies their decisions. Hmm. So, yeah, you just got to be careful that you've included everything you should have and that you understand your characters yourself. Hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That's quite interesting. Yeah. And um, you're not the first writer to sort of talked about their characters as though they were sort of alive Um, and, you know, that they sort of create their own, I guess, psyche within your within your head as you're writing. Yeah. Um, And it kind of leads me to start thinking that it it almost seems like a lot of writers seem to be a little, what do you call it, Uh, split personalities? multiple personalities. Mm-hmm. Um, do you ever find that like when you're very, very intensely working on a book and then you go out and you sort of have, say, a couple of drinks with a couple of friends that that psyche actually that becomes you at that given point? Um, anyway, I'd say I know a lot of writers talk about um, 
or a lot of readers talk about uh, the characters which are clearly the self inserts from the author. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would actually say that every character, in a way, is a self insert mm-hmm. because it's an aspect of the writer. Mm-hmm. Um, so I know that most of my characters do portray different parts of me in their own way. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely say that some do, like they exaggerate, basically. Um, mm. Yeah, I'd say that yeah, some do definitely um, come to the fore more often than not. Mm. Um, so yeah, cause, yeah, it is a very tricky thing to explain in some ways because. Um, yeah, but the, the characters both are and aren't the author at the same time. Mm. Um, I mean, it, it it is sort of like the author's understanding of a caricature, if anything else, or a caricature of a trait that they possess. That mm-hmm. that sort of comes to the forefront as far as well as far as my like limited judgment on the subject is concerned. Mm. Well, correct me if I'm wrong. Okay. No, no, no. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd say that's that's fairly accurate, yeah. Mm. I mean, just being able to live into the character is, I guess, to a large extent, as much as an art as, as anything beyond that, I guess. Mm. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, because there are definitely some characters, some of my characters, where I can um, get into their mindset a lot easier than others. Mm. Um, but even ones who have views and goals so completely different to mine, especially yeah. for villains, um, for them it's just, you know, it's, it's fun writing about those because they are so wildly different. And yeah, I'm able to put myself into a perspective of, um, yeah, what would it be like to be this sort of character? Uh, so I'm able to, to view it that way even knowing that they're acting in ways I would never act myself. Okay. Huh. I just saw interesting cosplay, uh, which involved um, a Zootopia, I'm looking at it right now, girl wearing grey bunny ears in a cop suit with a very, very interesting version of the fox. <laughs> Okay. It's uh, kind of creepy, actually. Sorry, I, I, get, I get distracted because there's another person with another screen right next to me. Um, and he's looking at a lot of, oh my god, a lot of pictures. <laughs> I, I don't really want to know. Keep yourself together. Okay. Um, hey, I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying. Um, it's actually kind of interesting, like, how we, how we look at characters and things like that. And, I mean, obviously... Um, has have have any of your characters ever been sort of almost loosely based on books that you read beforehand? I know that you mentioned Aragon and um, how the reasoning for that was was I guess um, to yeah, a small I mean, extent that, different. Yeah. Um, I try and avoid basing characters off of um, previous books I've read, uh, just because yeah, I feel that is a bit. Um, like, uh, plagiarism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of edges towards plagiarism a bit too much. I mean, uh, mm-hmm. I might, I might name characters after inspired off of previous characters, but I don't base the character themselves. Mm-hmm. Like, for example, I have is um, I've got two in my Destiny Dragon series. There's two dragons who are twins, and mm-hmm. They're, known, they're called Kaz and Ariel. Yeah. And they're named after a character in a Maggie Fury novel uh, or series, which is the Shadow League series, which is one of my favorite book series. And there's a Drake in there called Kazel. So yeah. I basically split the name up into Kaz and Ariel. Mm. Uh, so kind of putting that in there as a bit of a uh, reference to a book I admire, but the characters themselves are nothing like Gazelle. Hmm. Uh, so just kind of borrowing a name to just give a bit of a nod towards the books I like, but hmm. I would take more from that. 
because uh, I mean, obviously, uh, from from a from an English literature uh, lecture side, because we do touch on on intertextuality quite a lot, and the very fact yeah. that the the author almost doesn't exist within within books, and one shouldn't look at the author when you're critically looking at other books. But obviously, one of the things we have to do is obviously critically look at the author as to why the author wrote the book in the first place. Yeah. Um, does does that happen very often in um, you know fantasy novels and things like that? Obviously, there's there's general canon that that gets put into place. Like dragons are like this. Have you ever written yeah. a dragon differently from the way that a dragon was, I guess, meant to be written? Well, yeah. I mean, I'd say in Destiny of Dragons, mm -hmm. uh, my dragons are at the largest about four feet tall. Uh huh. So they're wow. small. Okay. Um, they don't breathe fire. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, the only thing out of a traditional view of dragons that they have is they are scaled, mm -hmm. they have four legs, and they have wings. Okay. Um, beyond that, they're not typical dragons. Uh, and there are reasons for that within the um, law of the world. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, in fantasy, there is the. Um, the archetype of fantasy, which is the dragons, the elves, the dwarves, mm -hmm. the orcs, or similarly, similarly named. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that stems largely from Tolkien. Mm. Yeah. Uh, who is very much the, um, the inspiration for a majority of fantasy writers. Yeah. But at the same time, you'll see a lot of books which are clearly fantasy, but absolutely nothing like Tolkien at all. Yeah. Um, like they may still be set in a fantasy world, but there may not be any elves, there may not be any orcs, there may not be any dragons. Um, and yeah, so it's good to have a mixture of those, I'd say. Oh. But, um, okay. Yeah, I mean, for my writing, I do try and have it familiar enough to fantasy writers, but also always like to have my own my own take on it and try and have something new even on the um, older, not cliches, but um, the tropes, basically. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. They're, they're present in fantasy, but I like to have something a little bit different about them. It's always good to be aware of those tropes more so than anything else, more than just trying to like avoid yeah. them. Because if you can see it in your yes. own work, like this is very akin to something that is like so established in the lore, and like, if you can sort of turn it on its head, it makes for slightly more interesting reading. Yeah, I mean, hmm. you're never going to have a story that's not got any cliches or tropes in it. Of course not. Yeah. It's not going to happen. Tropes are just um, sort of storytelling shorthand, it's, so you don't have to explain yeah, everything from the beginning. Yeah, yeah kind of a like, yeah, kind of bit, of, bit of signposting in a way. Yeah. Or grounding in a way. Yeah. Just yeah. saying, yeah, okay, this is what you can expect from this sort of story. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, you don't have to go into so much detail about explaining absolutely everything because readers, if they're familiar with this genre, they'll already know. Yeah. Mm. All right, cool. Hmm. I mean, and, and when it does come to sort of that that perspective, and again, like we're, we're talking about this from, I guess, more of an academic perspective when it comes to, to books and, and how one reads and how one reads books uh, and I guess sometimes the academic approach does sort of stunt the idea of I guess free thought in books because obviously when you look at it I, again I, I refer back to intertextuality um, I mean it's it's not like you could say write an existentialist uh, novel uh, with fantasy characters as as well as you would say with you know different perspectives because yeah. I know that one, one of my students right now is, is literally looking at Lord of the Rings and um, uh, Star Wars and he's yeah. looking at Marxist themes within both of them hmm. which is a completely weird thing to do uh, but like we, we laud him for his ability to do so which is actually yeah. pretty interesting and um, could have stuck I mean, with Animal Farm <laughs> no scratch <laughs> Animal Farm is, is in and of itself just, uh, it's, it's a tired dog now. It, it should be put out of its misery, and Marxism should be looked at in other things. Doesn't make it a bad book. 
It's been studied yeah, to death, I'd but it doesn't lot. make it a bad yeah. book. Yeah. Say a lot it's, of all the uh, theory stuff. It can be very interesting at times. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But at other times, it's finding meaning when there isn't any, in a way. Mm. Yeah. Because I know, I know a lot of theories that I study at university, they um, often talked about how the author clearly meant this when they were writing it, or they had this thing in mind, and it's like, well, probably not. I mean, I know I, for one, I certainly don't think about what themes I'm putting into my book. Mm -hmm. I don't think about any of that sort of stuff. I mean, I just write what the story should be. Mm -hmm. And yet I know if someone did sit down and do a, one of those theoretical readings, they'd probably find all sorts of things in there. <laughs> and say that I meant such and such and such and such when it was like, no, I just wanted to write about a dragon. Yeah. Yeah. But, and perhaps that's all it was. Which I suppose does come into the whole author is dead theory where yeah, what the author means means absolutely nothing when it comes down to it. So Yeah. But any any piece of work um that uh, like anyone produced, be it art or like uh, uh, writing or poetry or games or whatever, there is there is something that you say about, uh, like, I wouldn't say your biases, but things that you hold as, like, as an as a norm or as, um, like, a belief that you have that other people can come across and say, like, this is actually, like, sort of racist. But this is actually sort of, yeah. like, um, I don't know, a little bit, like, nihilistic. But you you didn't even you didn't even mm. know like that was the undertone or like a, some, like a the tongue in cheek point that you were making, but because you were just you know I'm just writing a story, but yeah, yeah. Uh, like something like um, I recently watched an interesting extra, extra credits episode about the division, where like the whole game it's like through the mechanics of the game you like uh, the idea of uh, totalitarianism is lauded and um, people and like martial martial law is just like the norm it's like yay it's like you get experience points for shooting people that haven't done anything just because a guy on the radio yeah. tells you to kind of thing mm. like the, whatever anyone produces uh, if they don't like sometimes sit back and look at it with a critical eye they people can start see you can completely convey the wrong message sometimes yeah Sorry for that tangent. Yeah, right. no, no worries. It's worth it. I mean, like that's that's pretty much the that's that's the extent or not the extent that part part and parcel of uh, what to a large extent intertextuality is. Mm. In that, um, again, the what the author means and what the author wants to say uh, versus what has been said about it can be two completely different things. I mean, yeah, again, I mean, everyone's, everyone's going to look at things in a different way from different perspectives mm -hmm. and quite often come with out with different meanings. I mean, that's just the nature of what it is yeah. um, for people to look at it. I mean, no one's going to have the same experience as someone else. No, of yeah. course. And it's it's not like... Uh, and it's, it's actually kind of interesting that... Um, as as an author, I, I guess one would want to hear these these weird theories about your books and things like that, and sort of sit there maybe chuckle to yourself a little bit. Oh, it's uh, fascinating sometimes, yeah. Mm. <laughs> you see how differently people read it to how I expected them to read. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, there can be some very different ones sometimes. Sit, sit there reading, it's, it's like, it's not oh, like no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's not like you can direct them that far and you can sit there going like, okay, cool, before you read this, read the plot synopsis for like the next 20 minutes as to mm -hmm. how I thought this should be read and then read it and to see whether you do that. And you kind of sit there going like, well, you're leading your reader way too far into this and they really have to be able to, I don't know, making your own, it's, that's, that's, the, that's the part about reading that's, that's always very interesting, being able to make your own sort of conclusions as you're going through the book going like okay this yeah. character is going to do this now and because I mean that's that's sort of the one thing that the readers tend to do is, is that they try to to presuppose the idea and when that when that's uh, 
I guess that twist comes around. And you sit there going, like, I was never expecting that to happen. Yeah. Um, that's the part, that's the reason, that's, I think, to a large extent, that's what makes a good book, is that yeah. you can lead a person to the point that they sit there going, like, yes, okay, I know exactly where this, okay, I didn't see that coming. But what's um, an even better book is when you have that moment of, I never saw that coming, then you go back and read it again and go, oh, hang on a minute. Yeah. And you can see, then, with the knowledge of how it's going to end, you can then see the clues put in. Um, and that makes an even better book. Yeah. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I'll always hold J.K. Rowling in such high yeah. esteem. Mm -hmm. Because um, with her portrayal of Snape, mm. I, I don't think there's any better character in fantasy fiction ever mm -hmm. just because mm -hmm. of his motivations and how his and how his portrayal you never know which side he's going to turn yeah he's an asshole and in book seven finally, yeah <laughs> and when you finally know whose side he's on and his motivations it all clicks and, but you can go back and read book one, and you just notice little things. And it's like, actually, yes, that all makes sense now. Hmm. Just little things he does, and it's like, I know why he does that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. But, I mean, I, mean, I guess 2020 20, 20 vision in hindsight most of the time. Yeah. I mean, as soon as you know that this is going to happen, you read back, and you're like, oh, that's what it meant. Yeah. And... Look, I mean, everything needs to have a little bit of readability or re-readability in it, and it's it's probably one of the reasons why, I guess, and it's unfortunate, I was never able to get back to, uh, you know, Harry Potter and, and things like that because the movie's sort of out. Uh, I think w with a lot of things happening in my life, I, I couldn't read the books and watch the movies at the same time. And yeah. at one point, I made, like, I made a cardinal sin of watching the movie before I'd finished reading the book. And then just never watched either ever again. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, I, I stopped around about book five, and then of course uh, Scratch um, had, did another cardinal sin by telling me things that had happened in another book that I was still busy reading, and I hated oh, for yeah. it. Which one was that again? <laughs> um, uh, 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 Dumbledore. I didn't know about that. Like, yes, you did. You mentioned it. <laughs> You also ruined an anime like that for me. Yeah, I still hate I know. you for it. Yeah. Now well. And I, I don't know. I, I would consider myself maybe a little bit more mercurial as a reader. Um, I've I've fallen away from actively reading books, uh, mostly because I just have I, I do have too little time to be able to read them, and for that matter, write them if I have, if I really wanted to. I can't get into 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 getting into that. I mean, like. I wouldn't be able to spend two hours writing now because that would be two hours marking that I have to, you know, put away. Yeah. And, I, yeah, it's uh, concentration is, is something that, that needs to be done. And, I mean, I guess I, c I could put in an hour and a half for a podcast, but I <laughs> can't put in an hour and a half for a book. Yeah, priorities. Yeah. Anime. <laughs> <laughs> Gaming. All those Speaking things. of which, um, when when you look at the sort of advent of storytelling and gaming as well, I mean, uh, I know that you you might not necessarily be as avid a gamer as myself or Scratch is, but for I know for myself and um, I think Scratch too, uh, when it comes to being able to read uh, or be part of a a game as well, the storytelling has to be of such a level that you you want to be able to continue playing. And sometimes yes. it forces you to play for 12 hours straight because you want to know what's going to happen. Mm. Yeah, well, that's saying a good story do. leads yeah. to good immersion. Yeah. Mm. If you're immersed in a story, you want to keep on going. Mm. But if it's, a, if it's a substandard story, then it's like, well, what's my motivation to keep, keep at it? Yeah. Mm. Um, Would you... Uh, yeah, no, go. No, Who, was me? It? Who me? No, 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 go for it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I, I was gonna I was gonna go into a tangent again, but just continue going. I'll I'll okay. get the well, door just. Well, yeah. I, mean, I think I was just kind of something up what I was just said. Like, yeah, good ah. immersion means that you're gonna want to keep on playing. 
Uh, and yeah, you need a good story for that. So, yeah. mm. uh, which kind of leads me to my follow-up. Obviously, um, if if you could, would you write a story for a game? Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I suppose I could. I mean, I have actually had um, someone ask me that mm -hmm. before. I mean, he, he's producing a game, and it was like, do you want to be involved? In writing, but it's just something I couldn't dedicate the time to at the time. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it would be a very different type of writing. You've got to, because um, you, of course, have to take into account um, player actions. I mean, players aren't always going to react the same, so you've got to mm. make sure this it's a story where people can um, can have choice in. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, rather than just taking them down a linear path. Yeah. I'll be honest, like, I can excuse a linear path, and almost like support a linear path, um, if what happens in the story sort of um, is enforced by the actions. Like, um, yeah. how can I say this without spoiling too much? If anyone's ever played the first Bioshock, like, the twist about like 90% of the way through um, made... It, it made a lot of sense in, like, retrospect, doing what you were doing. I don't know if anyone's played it before. Any of you two? No, I personally haven't, but, <laughs> yeah, I have not. <laughs> okay. Um, but, yeah, uh, suffice it to say, there's, like, a, there's a twist about, like, 90% of the way through the game that just, like, puts everything that you've done up until this point into context, and it was one of those real, like, <sighs> mindfuck, uh, uh, endings to the game, and um, it was th 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 that writing that story, given the knowledge of what the player was going to do throughout the game, like mechanically and um, like uh, habitually, it it made a lot of sense. Like you have to be able mm. to weave the story together with uh, the mechanics of the game. Uh, like any branching paths need to sort of tie up at some point. If you have a dead branch, then like people are gonna whine, I swear. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, like there's a lot of things to take into account when you do uh, like write for gaming. It's a very different medium. Mm. Yeah, I say it's the same as sort of thing as well for film. Again, it's a very different mm. style yeah. of writing you've got to use there. Yeah, because yeah. uh, what's that thing they always say like from from writing to screen? Like, uh, show, don't tell, but then from gaming, then, uh, like, from uh, TV to gaming, it's, like, do, don't show kind of thing. Like, it's that yeah. Yeah, that added layer of, um, like, <sighs> extrapolation and uh, representation that adds uh, like a, another set of criteria that needs to be fulfilled in another, uh, almost, like, uh, landmine that you shouldn't tread on when writing yeah. for these kinds of things. Hmm. That's, that's very interesting. I mean, I guess to each his own uh, a lot of the time. I mean, a linear game versus a non-linear game where you have like 3,000 different endings. Mm -hmm. And especially if you're a completionist in games, you would try to do all three to four to five to seven different endings. And eventually you'll get bored of the game because the, the replayability or the, the choices weren't very well thought out. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but... I mean, you'll get... Yeah, scratch. Yeah, but then what's the focus of your game? Is it like mechanical longevity or do you have a story to tell? Which Which, like... Because you can tell a story in video games by giving the player agency, and that makes you identify with the characters more, because it's not mm. playing out in front of you, you're involved in it. So, yeah. do you want to have the game like be a game that you can like play constantly, like so something like uh, The Binding of Isaac, or uh, yeah. Enter the Gungeon, or something like that, that's made to be constantly replayed, with minimal story attached to it, or are you going to like put out something that you want some want these people to like walk through the story and in the shoes of this character to mm -hmm. come to a resolution at the end of the day? Yeah, and you have like ones which do both. I mean, you've got the stories which give the player completely free reign of what to do, but mm -hmm. 
still telling a story. Like you look at the Bethesda games. Mm-hmm. Yeah, fair point. You, you're free to do whatever you want, but mm-hmm. there's still a story behind it all. Mm. And I say that's the most yeah. challenging. Yeah. Like. And there are multiple ways to accomplish missions and like get to your end goal. Yeah. And that is that is mm-hmm. like the strength of something like New Vegas. Well, like New Vegas. Yeah. I mean, um, talking about like I guess storylines and games and and I think things like that. I mean, like you you look at your walking simulators that they've got these days, mm-hmm. uh, which has now become a game genre. Um, <clears throat> I mean, you've got uh, Dear Esther, which I think started it in, the, in 2009, where mm-hmm. you just you were just a person walking on an island, listening yeah. to a person narrating why you were on the island. And there's stuff and like Gone Home and uh, Firewatch and all that kind of stuff. Firewatch was good, though. I, I quite enjoyed Firewatch. I still have to try that. And I don't know, like, I mean, it's, 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 it's quite interesting how, I guess, when it comes to the writing medium, versus the playability medium. I think people want to be even more involved in, in, in the books or the, the stories that they're being placed into. And I'm not necessarily sure whether, whether that's being seen in the writing industry or not, but <clears throat> that very fact that in, in the one, on the one hand, you've got people you know, playing games the entire time for storyline or for whatever reason they want to, unless it's, you know, the run and gun, um, you know, Call of Duty games that you'll get like every year, um, yeah. <clears throat> or anything like that. Or you can create your own story if you're playing FIFA to a small extent that you've gone and created your own player, and your player is going to play for this team, and then they're going to move out of that team, and then they're going to get too old. But they never get too old. Um, they can play until they're 40 or 42, uh, circa Ryan Giggs. Um, yeah. <clears throat> but I mean, like even then. You you can create your own footballing story if you wanted to by playing the game, or you can create your own little backstory for a person within something like that. So, I mean, you, you're kind of sitting in this dichotomy of, um, you know, how do you engage your reader, and can you engage them more uh, because of gaming? I mean, uh, Scratch, I read an article the other day about um, gamification of like a whole bunch of things. One person even went as far as to say, has gamification gone too far? Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess that's, that's probably a question that I could ask Jay, is, is that do you feel that people are reading less because they're gaming more, because they're more engaged with the story, or is it because they don't feel like reading? Oh. Um, in... I'd say, in a way, yeah. I mean, people are reading less, I'd say, just because society in general is moving away a little bit from that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, like, people are still, yeah, like, people are still involved with story, like, mm-hmm. through gaming or through film. So, yeah, they're still consuming stories. It's just in a different medium. Mm-hmm. And I don't think that's necessarily good or bad. It's just it's just changing Mm. um and even people who are reading their stories and you've got the rise of ebooks which when that first started happening people were saying oh the print book is not going to last a couple more years it's dead it's not it's Mm. going away it's gone and yet it's still here yeah um books are a part of culture and a part of history Mm-hmm. And because of that, they're never going to go away. Um, yeah, they're having to adapt to modern technology, but so, so yeah, you've got your ebooks, you've got your audio books. Um, and but yeah, I mean, you could argue that books are becoming games in a way. Mm. But it's just a new method of telling a story. Yeah. I mean, if if you look at uh, Tempo, Tempo is busy sort of working on a on a game much like that, um, where it's it's a book that is scratch. What was it called again? Um, um, Alison and the Awesome New Robot, robot or girl. something. Yes, yes, that one. Which I mean, I, and again, like like that. yeah, it's choose. Wow, that's that's creepy. Um, sorry. <laughs> Focus. Yeah, no, look, he's looking at porn. Okay. God damn it! <laughs> Focus. 
It's the front page. We have a it's guest. I know. But, I mean, it's it's right next to me. Uh, I should put on blinkers or something like that. <laughs> there we go. He's turned the screen. That works. Um, but, I mean, like, if uh, with, with, with games like that or with uh, little stories and, and things like that, I mean, you, you'd find as a writer maybe that you'd also have a little bit more freedom. Or do you think that you've got less freedom uh, writing a game story? Um, so it's a different kind of freedom. Because um, with books, readers have certain expectations, but they'll have different expectations for a game. So it's it's a different set of rules in a way, I'd say. Mm-hmm. Um, mm. But yeah, some things you can do a lot more, like especially with interaction with games. Mm-hmm. Mm. But you can't do with books. But at the same time, that'll also limit what you can do. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it's just like it's a different way of consuming a story. It's a different way of writing a story. Yeah. Mm. And and uh, there has to be cons- consistencies between uh, the story that you're telling and the mechanics of the game world. Like, um, yeah. yeah. Fa- like Final Fantasy VII being a prime example. Like, uh, all the while when people. Like when people are slain in combat, you can use like what's it, uh, Phoenix down to resurrect them, but then Ares gets killed off, yeah. and then Phoenix downs are worthless. <laughs> so yeah. you have to obey the laws of the universe you're in, in both writing mm. and mechanics. Yes. Hmm. All right. Okay. Um, sheesh. It's it's been really really good speaking to you actually. Uh, like, I mean, you're our first guest from Australia, uh, Bar JM, who's in England, but he's been, he's from Australia, which is, yeah. it's, it's, it's kind of weird. Like, I mean, like, uh, I think I, I remember having that, that little chat with you and that JM yeah, 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 was yeah. from Australia <laughs> and then went to England. You're from England, gone to Australia. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and so I mean, uh, Australian Englishman and the English Australian. Yeah. Yeah. Fair <laughs> point. Australian man. <laughs> Which is which is actually quite interesting. I mean, we're we're quite um, quite happy to have you on because you're the first person who's about as south of the border as we are. Yeah. Um, I mean, we had Brazil, but they're where where they they were just just under the equator. Yeah, but they're closer to the equator than yeah. They're closer to yeah. the equator than they are to any other Capricorns. Oh, uh, Capricorns. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, it's the tropics. Yeah, tropics. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, like it's it's great, like talking writing with you. That was very very uh, enlightening, I guess. I don't think we've been able to do that with either Tempo or with Kyle as much. Um, uh, you are probably going to be up for a Ursa Major at some point, right? Uh, well, I had um, Impossible Magic was a finalist in last year's. Uh huh. Um, but I was up against some very good quality. Books. Uh, who was it who won it last year? I think it was it was Rukis who won the award for best novel uh, last yeah. year. Yeah, last year. Um, yeah, so I was up against some very good competition. But if I remember the voting, because they released the votes afterwards, and I think Post Magic was fifth in the category, but it was by far the closest category out of any of the. Um, any of them. So I was thrilled to even yeah. be a finalist, really. But um, I mean, you, you were going up against some, Rene, basically some yeah. of yeah, yeah, Huntress, yeah. Chikat so, yeah, uh, um, in the Alley, Forges of Dawn, and obviously Arukas won it with uh, Off the Beaten Path. Yeah, so yeah, with some of the um, biggest names in Furry mm-hmm. writing. Um, so, yeah. and yeah, because I've only been around the writing scene about the fairy writers for about three years since my first book so mm-hmm. I was I was pretty happy with that <laughs> huh. I, I mean interestingly enough I think I if I'm, I'm actually looking at it right now and of the five books that were here I actually uh, uh, mm-hmm. Impossible Magic was the only one that I clicked on um, to see what exactly that was about because that did seem a lot more interesting than you know something like Check Out in the Alley just on like title wise um and obviously, like the very first thing that one looks at is, is obviously the title to be able to see yes. whether the book would be readable. And when it comes to something like that, you kind of sit there going, like, hmm, this looks pretty interesting. Oh, um, 
<laughs> I will definitely be like I, th I think definitely most of us, um, at least the people who are listening, uh, will hopefully be able to sort of talk to you about whether or not talk to you, but try to find your, your website, which we will put up on the YouTube channel and and get you out there for for that yeah, kind well, of um, yeah. Always free to message me on Twitter and everything as well. I mean, mm. almost always on there. So <laughs> yeah. Uh, great, and I mean, thanks again for 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 coming. And uh, we'll obviously have this on at uh, eight o'clock tonight, which is way late or early for you guys. I think, if I'm not mistaken, it's at eight yeah. p.m. with me. Yeah, eight hours. Very early in the morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah like Maybe three a.m. or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I mean, I'm I'm glad that we could have you on, and we're definitely gonna see whether we can uh, do this again sometime. You know, get updates oh, yeah. and, and everything like that. Yeah, fantastic. <clears throat> and I mean, again, like first person from Australia, it's it's really, really, really nice to hear from from that side because most of our positions have been in Europe, uh, England, and America. Um, <clears throat> and I mean, like what the, the writing scene should be picking up or is picking up, as as Kyle would would say that it is getting there. And, oh, yeah, uh, oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's and we we hope that, that that with your writing as well, that people begin to sort of consider writing maybe more fantasy books because that that seems to be something that I guess sometimes falls by the wayside. I mean there's a a couple of sci fi and and you know uh those books out there. It's just that, you know, it's very, very few and far between. Yeah. No, yeah, I definitely yeah. love to see more fantasy and science fiction yeah. books because I've always loved those genres, so I love reading mm. them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, like most of the books out there are sort of semi slice of life and oh, yeah, modern times, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean, like hearing about dragons or say somebody writing a book about the uh, what are the guys from um, Skyrim, the Argonians and the Khajiit. 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 Yeah. Like I would love to. I would love to see somebody try to you know tie in with the Khajiit and and actually start writing books like that or. Using the the genre that was created by something like that to be able to then, you know, create something completely new um, with with those sort of fantasy elements, and maybe from a from a furry perspective, I guess. You know, adding yeah, a there's, new there's a yeah, there's a lot of potential, a lot of potential with that yeah. sort of thing. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, but yeah, so we'll um, we'll leave you to it. You'll be asleep in a couple of hours, I'm assuming. So uh, we bid you a good evening. Um, yes, yeah, it's been lovely, lovely talking to you. Yeah. And we'll, like I said, we'll we'll have this we'll have this run again this evening. And um, yeah, obviously there was there was nobody, at least nobody that I could see that has been listening on first stream. Uh, they could be listening without having to chat or anything like that. Maybe they're still waking up. <laughs> it is a Sunday <laughs> Sunday morning after all. Mm, Mother's Day exactly, breakfast yes. and all that. <laughs> So yeah, uh, we'll definitely see you again sometime. Uh, we'll keep in contact. Uh, Absolutely. Skype. Yeah. So yeah, we'll uh, we'll see you. <laughs> oh. Yes, definitely. All right. All right. Yeah. Thank, thank you for chatting, and yeah, thanks to everyone who's listening. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Thanks for coming. Yeah. All right. Cheers. Cheers. Cheerio. See ya. <laughs>